Somewhat hidden in these lists of numbers is the story of the Standard Bank of South Africa between 1863 and 1913, and we will get to both the figures and the story. But we first need some background of the events that led to the establishment of a British bank in the Cape Colony in 1863 in the first place. The story starts when Bartholomew Diaz, the first Portuguese mariner to reach South Africa, discovered the Cape in 1488 and went as far as Algoa Bay, later to be known as Port Elizabeth, the very place where Standard Bank would open for business 375 years later. In 1652, the Dutch East India Company established a halfway station at the Cape of Good Hope under Jan van Riebeek to provide a safe harbour for ships on their way to the east. After the French Revolution of 1789, France declared war on almost any country in Europe still ruled by a king. France overthrew the Dutch Republic in 1795 and established a pro-French government in the Netherlands. This meant that the Cape was now indirectly under French control. Britain realized that a French occupation of the Cape would threaten English trade with India and the East. In order to avoid this, Britain sent four warships to the Cape. The small Dutch garrison at the Cape was no match for the English and surrendered in September 1795. Britain and France reached an agreement and a treaty between the two countries in 1802 brought a temporary truce to Europe. Britain agreed in terms of the treaty to return the Cape to the Dutch. The treaty, however, broke down in 1805 and Britain promptly reoccupied the Cape in January 1806. And this is how it came about that Britain governed the Cape Colony when Standard Bank opened for business in Port Elizabeth in January 1863. But there were also the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. During the 1830s and 1840s, in what became known as the Great Trek, about 15,000 voortrekkers, unhappy with the British rule, left the Cape and moved inland. The British annexed Natal in 1843. Between 1852 and 1854, Britain recognized the Transvaal and the Orange Free State as independent republics. Although the Dutch occupied the Cape as early as 1652, the first bank in South Africa was only established on 15 March 1793 in Cape Town. It was a government-owned bank called the Bank van Leening or Lombard Bank that provided credit at a rate of 5% per annum against qualifying collateral, namely property and gold. It was essentially a mortgage bank. When Britain occupied the Cape Colony in 1806, new rules and regulations were obviously introduced there. Although South Africa, to this day, has a Roman Dutch based legal system, its business or mercantile law approach was strongly influenced during the British rule. British occupation opened the export market for the Cape. Britain employed a system called Imperial Preference and as a British colony, the Cape was allowed to export wine to Britain at much lower duties than paid by France and other foreign countries. This benefit was, however, removed in 1831. Cape exports then shifted from wine to wool. 
A separate branch of the government-owned Lombard Bank was established in 1808. The new discount bank accepted deposits on which interest was paid and used the funds to discount bills of exchange and promissory notes and to advance loans against suitable credit. The first private banks started operating in the Cape in the 1830s. They were typically small unit banks without branches and owned by local merchants that provided the most basic of banking services. Although these private banks were normally well managed, banking only started to really take off in the 1860s. In order to open a bank in a British colony at the time, one required a charter from the king himself. This changed in 1862 when the English Company Act was passed by the British Parliament. This new act allowed for companies to register with limited liability. In terms of limited liability, a company became a separate legal entity with its own rights and obligations and shareholders were only liable to the extent of their investment in the company. Instead of having to request permission from the king, the idea of free banking was introduced. This does not mean that banking services were offered free of charge. It just meant that from then on, any company could operate as a bank, if it complied with the prescribed regulations and requirements stipulated in the Act. The Standard Bank of British South Africa was one of the first companies to register in London under this new Act. South Africa in the 1860s was still an agricultural society in a remote area of the world. It took more than 40 days to reach London on a steamship. The telegraph only reached as far as Simonstown and Paul, and the first railway was still under construction between Cape Town and Wellington. This table shows the exports from the Cape and Natal between 1807 and 1870 in thousands of pounds. The colonies mainly exported wine, fruit, maize, sugar, meat, wool, animal hides, ostrich feathers and mohair. The financial press at the time was not in favour of extending limited liability to banks. The Bankers magazine referred to it as banking mania and expressed the opinion that this would end in a crisis which would not only sacrifice the principles of limited liability but seriously involve directors, shareholders and others in a common ruin. With reference to the Standard Bank of British South Africa, the same magazine however stated that the directors were men of experience with satisfactory colonial connections and that there was no reason why this establishment should not be prosperous and successful. The article also predicted that the Standard Bank of British South Africa would absorb and take over the smaller banks in the Cape, Port Elizabeth and Natal in order to concentrate the transactions of the colony. With the support of certain merchants in Port Elizabeth, the Cape Colony, and with capital raised in London, the Standard Bank of British South Africa Limited was established in 1862 with John Patterson as chairman. The bank's capital was fixed at £1 million, consisting of 10,000 shares of £100 each, with the power to increase its share capital to £2 million. Shareholders were, however, only required to pay £25 of the £100 per share. This £25 constituted the bank's paid-up capital, and the remaining £75, referred to as the reserve liability, would only be called if the bank required it. In other words, 
Shareholders had to pay £25 per share upfront and undertook to pay the remaining £75 per share if and when called to do so. The first share issue was also limited to £5,000, providing the bank with £125,000 paid up capital and an additional amount of £375,000 that could be called up if needed. It is interesting to take note of the arrangements at the time. According to the prospectus detailing the Standard Bank share issue, one pound was payable on application and another one pound on allotment. Shareholders could then be called upon to pay not more than five pounds per share in three month intervals until the full 25 pounds had been paid. The proposed company received application for 43,000 shares before the closing time stated in the prospectus. Remember, only 5,000 shares were on offer. Applications for Standard Bank shares actually traded at a premium of 30 to 40 shillings per share on the London Stock Exchange. According to The Economist of 18 October 1862, the Standard Bank was designated to carry on every sort of banking business in the colonies of South Africa. So the question is, what did banks do at the time? Banks accepted deposits. The money of the day was gold and silver coins. From the start of coinage, it was a clear rule that only the state could mint coins. There was no mint in South Africa at the time. Britain declared the British silver coinage as legal tender in the Cape in 1825 and these coins were minted in London. The coins in circulation in the Cape however included Spanish, Dutch, Indian and French coins as well. The coins traded according to the value of their gold and silver content irrespective of origin. With so many foreign ships anchoring at the Cape, it is easy to understand the variety of coins that was used. Banks accepted these coins on deposit. As the goldsmiths of old, banks were also allowed to issue notes. These notes started off as mere receipts confirming that gold or silver coins were in fact deposited for safekeeping. The idea was that if the owner wanted his or her gold or silver coins back, the receipt had to be produced. These receipts, however, started to trade. People used the receipts to pay for transactions. Whoever had the receipt could at any stage call at the bank to obtain the gold or silver for which the receipt was issued in the first instance. The receipts were therefore convertible into gold or silver. Noticing that the receipts were used in trade, the goldsmiths and then the bankers that followed started to issue receipts without the accompanying gold or silver coins. This was possible since not everybody insisted on converting the receipts into coin, referred to generally as specie. In this manner, the receipts were eventually only partially or fractionally backed by specie. So banks accepted coins and issued notes. The notes were convertible or redeemable into specie at the face value of the note, referred to as par value, at the branch that issued the note. Notes presented for redemption at another branch or at another bank were subject to a commission, a source of income for the banks. When notes were presented to a bank, they were paid out in specie. Banks were therefore required to have enough specie on hand to do so. Bear in mind also that all banks issued their own notes. 
If another bank's note or even a note from another branch of the same bank was offered for conversion into specie, the bank had to obtain the specie from the bank or branch concerned. This introduced the basics of clearance and settlement. Banks also issued drafts, a bank check, where payment was guaranteed by the bank that issued the draft. Banks advanced loans. The main type of loan at the time involved the discounting of bills. This can be explained as the prepayment of an invoice. A seller would obviously require payment for any goods sold. If the buyer did not pay on delivery by using either specie or banknotes, then the seller would issue an invoice requiring payment at some time in the future. Banks discounted these invoices or bills by paying the seller a lesser amount than the face value of the bill. The bank would then recover the full amount of the bill when the bill became due for payment. The difference between the discounted amount paid by the bank and the full maturity value would then constitute an income for the bank. In 1862, the discount rate of first-class bills in the Cape Colony ranged between 8 to 12 percent. In summary, banks converted their liabilities, consisting of shareholders' capital, gold and silver deposits, and banknotes issued, into assets, consisting of specie on hand and loans made. A bank's liabilities represented a source of funds that enabled the bank to conduct banking business and a bank's assets indicated how these funds were used. City banks were doing business in the Cape Colony in January 1863. They had a combined capital of £3,350,000. The combined balance sheet of these city banks was as follows. Standard Bank opened for business in January 1863 in the Guardian Building, Main Street, Port Elizabeth. On the first floor above the offices of the Commercial Bank of Port Elizabeth. True to the prediction in the Bankers Magazine, Standard Bank immediately started on the acquisition trail. The strategy was growth through acquisition and amalgamation. Standard Bank and the Commercial Bank of Port Elizabeth shareholders agreed to amalgamate the two banks in February 1863. Advertisements in the press announced at the same time Standard Bank's intention to expand to other parts of the Cape Colony and Natal. Standard Bank invited the smaller banks to talk about amalgamation in order to form a single, strong bank with the means and the resources to grow. By August 1863, Standard Bank had branches in Victoria West, Grahamstown, Colesburg, Durban, Utenaig, Jemansdorp, Zierbron and Cape Town. In order to finance the growth and the acquisition of a number of smaller banks, Standard Bank issued additional shares. The bank decided not to call on the existing shareholders to contribute more funds. Remember that the existing shareholders were only required to pay £25 of the initial share issue of £100 per share. The bank could therefore have asked the existing shareholders to pay some of that outstanding £75. The bank, however, decided to issue new shares under the same terms and conditions as before. At the first ordinary general meeting of shareholders, held on 2 October 1863, the Standard Bank Board approved a 12% dividend. Standard Bank shares were already trading at a £13 premium. 
From the minutes of the board meetings held between 1864 and 1869, it was evident that it was Standard Bank's policy, while being fair to shareholders with regard to the payment of dividends, to continuously increase the bank's reserves as a buffer against possible bad and doubtful debts. This more conservative approach was in line with what was happening internationally. The American Civil War was being fought at the time, between 1861 and 1865, with obvious economic implications for the rest of the world in general, and the Cape Colony specifically, as a result of reduced trade around the Cape of Good Hope. Domestic problems included a drought in the colony that affected food production, tension on the borders, and falling wool prices on the London market due to a change in the fashion habits in Europe. Defaults and liquidations increased in the colonies. Standard Bank was also affected by domestic politics. March 1865 is a good example of this. The fourth strat of the Orange Free State adopted a resolution in terms of which all foreign bank branches denounced as foreign capitalists needed the express permission of the Volksrat itself in order to operate in the Orange Free State, similar to the days when a charter was required from the king. What happened just before this resolution was passed and which effectively brought about the closure of Standard Bank's branches in Bloemfontein, Forrest Smith and Smithfield is of interest. Standard Bank presented some notes issued by the Bank of Bloemfontein to the Bank of Bloemfontein for specie. The Bank of Bloemfontein did not have the required specie and issued bank drafts to Standard Bank instead. When the amount due reached £10,000, Standard Bank began to apply some pressure on the Bank of Bloemfontein to deliver the required specie. The resolution passed by the Volksrat with reference to foreign banks referred to above followed. The Standard Bank would only return to Bloemfontein again in March 1900 when the British forces under Lord Roberts occupied the town and when the British army needed a bank through which the soldiers could be paid. The Bank of Bloemfontein had, in the meantime, been taken over by a new bank, the National Bank of the Orange Free State, mostly owned by the Orange Free State government. eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy one were bad years in the colonies. It was a time of severe depression. Having a policy of constantly increasing the bank's reserve account was a prudent move, since losses did occur and funds had to be used from both the reserve fund and profits to settle bad debts amounting to seventy three thousand pounds. Standard Bank did not pay a dividend in 1865 and the reserve account reflected a zero balance in June 1868. Standard Bank tightened credit during this time period and reorganized the bank's operations. Branches up till then operated under local boards of directors allowing these branches to function as if they were separate institutions. Standard Bank was restructured and the management of all branches was centralized under a general manager in charge of all domestic branches and operations, with a direct reporting line to the Board of Directors in London. Although 1866 to 1871 were lean years, Standard Bank dividend payments remained flat at around 4%. Diamonds were discovered in Griqualand West in 1869, and this would provide the impetus for the growth of the 1870s. Wool exports improved, property values increased, and the bank's bad and potential bad debts reduced. In 1872, the Donald Curry line of steamboats introduced a route to the Cape, providing the Cape with another link to the rest of the world. 
Standard Bank saw a business opportunity in the diamond industry. The idea was to advance between 10 and 15% to diamond miners against the security of any diamonds found. The bank would then assist with the sale of the diamonds in the European markets and settle with the diamond miner when payment was received. Trading in diamonds in this manner was easy for a bank registered in London and with international connections, but very difficult for local diamond miners. The problem was that the closest Standard Bank branch was in Colesburg, a four-day journey away. The diamond fields were proclaimed as British territory in 1871, which made things easier, and Standard Bank opened a branch in Clipdrift. The story goes that a Mr. Cole was sent to open the branch. When he crossed the Vol River, the safe, weighing some 1,800 pounds, slipped off the boat and fell into the water. Instead of sinking, the safe floated. The Eastern Province Herald reported in an article published on 23 December 1870 that the safe floated like a cork and congratulated Mr. Cole on the fact that his safe was not only fireproof but also waterproof. By the way, the safe was empty at the time. Further diamond discoveries followed at the Toy Spun and Colesburg Copy. The place became known as New Rush and later on Kimberley. Mr. O. H. Bate, a Standard Bank employee at the newly opened Kimberley branch, told the story of how the employees slept in the branch. One man in a hammock in front of the counter, one man in a hammock behind the counter, one man on the counter, one man on the accountant's table, and a fifth man on a stretcher in the manager's small office with a window that looked out onto a blacksmith's shed. The noise apparently was terrible. There was a rifle in each corner of the branch, and the staff also did sentry duty at the jail and the public offices when the diggers became rowdy. By 1879, most of the diggers had sold their claims, and 12 companies owned the Kimberley diamond mining operations. An estimated 12 million pounds was invested in the diamond mines at the end of 1881. All this from three former farms. The farm for Eitzig, sold initially for 6,000 pounds, Boltfontein was sold for 2,000 pounds, and Dorsfontein was sold for 2,600 pounds. Speculation in mining shares caused share prices to inflate and then to drop by 50%. The illicit diamond trade also played havoc with the price of diamonds. One diamond operator showed bank deposits of 156,000 pounds over a period of six months. The amalgamations with and acquisition of smaller banks, as well as the expansion of the Standard Bank branch network, continued in the 1870s. By 1879, Standard Bank had 43 branches. The total amount of all specie in the Cape Colony amounted to a million and fifty-seven thousand pounds. Seven hundred and three thousand pounds, or sixty-seven percent of this amount, was on deposit with Standard Bank. The following figures indicate the growth of the bank from 1870 to 1879. Standard Bank was also appointed as the sole banker of the government of the Cape Colony, a position that it maintained until the Cape Colony became part of the Union of South Africa in 1910. Towards the end of the 1870s, Standard Bank was one of the first to introduce a pension fund and a widows and orphans fund for its employees. Standard Bank's paid-up capital reached £1 million in 1880. A British Act passed in 1881 made provision for British banks to operate in areas outside British jurisdiction. 
Up till then, the official name was the Standard Bank of British South Africa. In 1883, the word British was dropped from the name and it became the Standard Bank of South Africa. The period between 1881 and 1885 showed another downturn in the economy. Businesses failed, arrears, overdue amounts, defaults and insolvencies increased, bank assets and notes in circulation declined, exports reduced, agricultural output contracted and property values fell. The situation improved after 1885 when diamond prices improved again and with the discovery of gold in the Transvaal, with large gold deposits found in the Witwatersrand. At the end of 1887, there were 270 gold mining companies in the Transvaal. Speculation in gold shares increased resulting in yet another crash in 1889. The Cape Banks Act was passed in 1891 and regulated the bank's ability to issue notes. Three big banks collapsed in 1890 and the issue of bank notes came under scrutiny. Although regulated in terms of an act in 1864, the issue of banknotes was actually unrestricted and only secure to the extent that a bank held specie. In terms of the Cape Bank Act of 1891, all notes issued in the Cape Colony had to be linked to government securities held by the bank. The issue of banknotes was now restricted by the amount of government securities held by a bank. This meant that if a bank failed, its notes would be secured against the proceeds of the government bonds that it held. Bank notes were also made legal tender. A mint conference was held in Pretoria in 1893. With all the gold being produced in the Transvaal, the government in Pretoria granted a national bank and mint concession to mint coins. The aim of the conference was to discuss the legislation involving coins minted in Pretoria and the coins used in the British colonies. At the time, the coins used in the colonies were minted in London. It was suggested at the conference that it was the opportune time to form a united approach and that all coins issued in South Africa be minted at an interstate mint in Pretoria and that all such coins be accepted as legal tender anywhere in South Africa to establish a truly national currency. Although the idea was generally applauded, the South African Republic government did not agree and the conference broke up. Tensions started to increase toward the end of the 1890s, which culminated in the Anglo-Boer War from 1899 to 1902. Although a British bank, Standard Bank's approach to politics and the rising tension was expressed as follows in a letter from the general manager to the board of directors. We view this without alarm. Our conviction being that the permanent interests of the country are safe and its progress sure, however slow, irrespective of the nationality of the government of the day. The bank's sure course is clearly to conduct its business on sound principles, to avoid controversial politics and to anticipate its own gradual developments alongside that of the colonies in which it carries on its operations. War was declared on 11 October 1899, but by then most banks had already sent their specie and other assets to the Cape and Port Elizabeth. Standard Bank held about £566,000 in specie in the Transvaal in 1900. Bank staff not willing to join the Boer cause were expelled from the Transvaal. Standard Bank had no branches in the Orange Free State at the time. 
There are, however, many stories of Standard Bank employees undertaking some interesting initiatives during this time. Unable to send the bank specie away safely, the manager at the Heidelberg branch divided the branch's specie and buried it in different places. When the Boers took Poch of Struem, the bank staff remained at the office. They were left in peace, except for the fact that the Boers commandeered some cash. The Boers presented a cheque to the branch for £1,000, drawn against an account called the Boer Trading Company. The Standard Bank manager, uh, Mr. Swart, only paid the amount after he was arrested on a charge of treason and when he was told that the withdrawal was authorized by President Paul Kruger himself. The bank manager insisted and managed to obtain an indemnity for this amount from the representatives of the Boer government. The manager subsequently met President Paul Kruger, who wanted to shake the hand of the Englishman who stuck to his post. In Pretoria, the bank staff attended to their duties during the day and did patrol duty at night. When martial law was declared, all the bank's assets were moved to the fort and stored with the ammunition underground. The branch, however, still operated for an hour every morning. When bombing and gunfire started, the teller, a Mr. Melville, would gather the small amount of gold and silver that he had with him and rush back to the fort. When it became too dangerous, he operated the branch from a tent within the fort. When Kimberley was besieged, the bank sent and received messages by heliograph and searchlight and large amounts of money was transferred in this manner through the bank using coded signals. A message received from the Mafeking branch dated the 9th of February but only received on the 28th of February advised that the branch had been moved to an underground bomb-proof shelter. In a later message dated the 13th of May, still in the middle of the war, the branch requested a supply of stationery in order to compile the branch's half-yearly returns due on 30 June. When money ran out, the branch started to trade in what was called siege notes, government drafts and goodfers, a piece of paper that stated that the issuer thereof was good for, therefore goodfers, was good for the amount indicated. These notes and drafts were usually issued in denominations of one pound, ten shillings, three shillings, two shillings and one shilling. The war ended in May 1902. By 30 June, all Standard Bank branches were open for business as usual. I mentioned right at the beginning of this presentation that the story of Standard Bank can be found in these numbers. This diagram shows the story of the numbers. This shows the sources of funds that Standard Bank had available between June 1863 and December 1913. It is evident that the largest source of funds was deposits. Paid up capital received from shareholders and notes issued by the bank remained very stable during this whole period. It was Standard Bank's stated strategy to drive growth through mergers, amalgamations and the expansion of the branch network. Deposits grew slowly between 1863 and 1871. These were the bad years for the colonies that coincided with the American Civil War and reduced international trade. Growth in deposits started with the discovery of diamonds in 1869. In 1879, Standard Bank had 43 branches and deposits had grown by 918% compared to 1870. A downturn in the economy followed between 1881 and 1885 along with a drop in international diamond prices. Diamond prices started to improve again and with the discovery of gold, 
The economy saw an upswing starting in 1885. Speculation in gold shares, however, caused a crash in 1889. The Mint Conference took place in Pretoria in 1893. Gold and diamonds again rescued the economy, bringing about major improvements until the end of 1895. Increased tension between the British colonies and the Boer republics resulted in the outbreak of the Anglo-Boer War in 1899. Additional British soldiers in the country was a main reason for the steep increase in deposits up to 1902. A period of recovery followed after the war with the usual negative implications associated with the aftermath of a war. Things started to improve in 1910 following the Union of South Africa. Note, however, that the deposit graph ends here with a dip. International tension increased during 1913 and this would result in the start of the First World War the next year, in 1914. Standard Bank's response to events between 1863 and 1913 is evident from this graph that shows the bank's asset position. The correlation between deposits and advances is evident. The same factors that affected the bank's deposits also had an impact on credit decisions. Note the steep movement in cash between 1894 and 1895. Remember cash consisted of gold and silver coins and it is evident that gold production impacted on the amount of money in circulation. Gold and silver coins were, however, again withdrawn from circulation in anticipation of the Anglo-Boer War, reaching its lowest point in 1899 when the war started. People wanted their gold and silver where they could see and control it, and not in a banking system that would soon be exposed to a war. The cash situation improved after the Anglo-Boer War, but deteriorated with some volatility as 1914 approached and war seemed inevitable. A balance sheet will obviously balance with total assets equal to total liabilities. This graph, however, shows the more operational aspects of Standard Bank's activities during this time. The assets, indicated in green, is the sum total of the advances, cash, short loans, investments and the bank's reserve fund. The liabilities, indicated in red, in turn, is the sum total of all the deposits, paid up capital and notes. It is by combining these values into a single graph, as indicated here, clear that Standard Bank maintained a healthy financial position during the period between 1863 and 1913. The Cape Times provides a suitable conclusion for this presentation. In an article of 5 February 1904, it made the following statement. It says a great deal for the sound business management of the banks that they have steered an even course in the boom and in the depression, with the result that, though business contracted, their position remains absolutely sound. There has been no serious collapse. There has been no financial panic. The banks may be congratulated on having passed through the period so well, and on being in a position to face, with equanimity, what still remains to be gone through.